when you have like a legitimate opportunity to decompress and recover and just live life and experience things and sometimes you learn things sometimes you you're able to come back with a fresh set of eyes and see elements of your strategy that were like a glaring hole but you couldn't see because you were too in it so jason Lewis is back on the podcast we want to talk about psychology what it take to have a winning trader mindset hey, jad welcome back on the podcast good to be here again uh tell me what's been going on since we last book it's been a while i think Yeah, thanks, Adrian. It's good to, great to see you. Uh, so, yeah, this summer for me was a chance to play more more golf at a high level, and uh, I did that. I won a tournament, which was cool. Um, but then, as the summer kind of progressed, I realized I was actually probably playing a bit too much and <laughs> not getting enough work in. So, uh, you know, I had to kind of put my toys away for a little bit. But uh, yeah, listen, I for those that don't know me, right? I, I'm not a trader, but I've I've worked. With professional traders for uh, you know a decade, I've worked with professional poker players for 15 years. I worked with the professional golfers for as long, so I know competition and professionalism at a very high level. And I myself, right, right, to you know, still like to play you know serious tournament golf. So you know, even though I'm not like making money on a day-to-day basis from trading, uh, I do understand the nature of competition at a high level and still like to you know kind of get my teeth wet here, or, you know, cut my teeth here a little bit and uh, get out there with the best of them. So. It sounds good. I, I want to start with a tough question, though. What do you reply when people say that, oh, you, you're not a trader, then therefore you can't cost traders because of that? What do you respond to that? I, I think it's it's a little misguided to think that the only people that can teach you are, are good traders, because at the end of the day, uh, a lot of the great traders that I've been around are awful uh, instructors, um, because they do a lot of things that are very instinctive and intuitive for themselves, and they, they really can't teach very well. And it's not just you know, traders, it's poker players and golfers and, you know, anybody at a high level that is capable of performing. So you, you need a little bit of what I'd call like amnesia, right? You, you don't want to have to know everything that makes you great. You just want to go do it. So, you know, I, I do think it's a little bit, uh, you know, that, that classic line, like, you know, those who do do and those who can't teach. I, I don't think it's totally fair because those that do are oftentimes awful teachers and those that can't, sometimes they just love to teach. And, and frankly, what, what I have learned for myself is like, I, 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 I genuinely love like the problem solving aspect of what's going to take somebody who's struggling and to help them kind of crack through their problems. And so I kind of relate myself to more of like the mechanic of like a, a like an F1 car, you know, like I, I don't need to be able to drive the car like the F1 driver needs to. I mean, th those guys have necks the size of tires You know, they've got reflexes that are, I mean, they've got a skill set that is completely different from a mechanic, but they need a mechanic who is capable of diagnosing every single problem in that car and understands the, the competition, understands the nature with, with which they have to perform. So yeah, you, you need to have multiple different facets. And so, yeah, there are traders uh, who have become psychologists who, you know, do coaching in my field um, and they offer something different than I do. But I offer something different than they do because I've got wisdom and experience from lots of different industries and validated processes and systems that that are true across the board because we're dealing with human performance, not just trading performance. And I've worked enough with traders to know the nuances of how you all are crazy. So <laughs> it all works together. I think having that, that outside perspective that doesn't come from trading only, that comes from like maybe a different discipline, like a sport or something, also kind of It's very valuable because sometimes you don't think about this in trading, but you could be really impact the way you trade or or help you do things better in trading too. So kind of cool. 100%. Yeah. And I think sometimes having an outside perspective, like, I, like I'm not saying that I invented the field by any means, right? I'm, but I am saying that I I have brought some new perspectives. And, and I think one of the big ones has been that greed is not what people think it is. Okay. Greed is not a problem. It's only a problem because it costs you money. Right. Nobody says, and I think we've talked about this before, nobody says that like Jordan and Tiger Woods and Rafa Nadal, like that those guys are greedy because they want to win so much. <laughs> okay. That's absurd. Right. Greed is only a problem because it costs you money. If they were doing things in their, their tactics and strategy that was greedy, then that would obviously be a problem and they clean it up fast. The other one is that a lot of traders experience fear you know, in like a performance anxiety kind of way. They don't, un they don't know that they have just 
paid entry into the most competitive marketplace in the world, which is just like playing, uh, just like paying money to go play in the NFL or the Premier League or to drive a car, you know, in a in a in an F one uh, event, you're going to experience a lot of fear and anxiety just getting thrown in there like that. So I think a lot of new traders experience way more heightened anxiety because they're not used to it, right? Most athletes and performers, they work their way up steadily over time and they kind of just condition themselves to the competitive environment. So when you are a new trader, right, you have to get experience. Do not spend an, like an excessive amount of time in the simulator because it's, it's not trading because you're not turning on the, the anxiety and the emotions and the heat in the intensity of actual competition. It's just training. And if you spend too much time training, thinking that you're actually playing, then your, the, like your anxiety is going to pop out of, the, out, of, out of your chest and it's going to be way harder for you to develop. We had a pretty interesting week in the market, I think last week and the week before that too, where there was a lot of volatility compared to the few weeks before and like a lot of big, big movements, price going up, price going down so quick. I guess this is when you get a lot of calls, people calling you to get help about their, their mindset. What does that like entail for traders? How can they deal with that better? Yeah, so I'd say generally speaking, the A, more experienced traders, but also the, the traders that are kind of far, a little farther along in our work, they're the ones that are, are able to capitalize on moves like that, right? I mean, they, they, like, they look for volatility events like that because they can uh, make a lot of money very quickly. Um, and, and also just like kind of not get as like kind of caught up in the emotion of the market, right? And the fear and the panic and or the euphoria of, as things kind of wick the other way. So, but the newer traders and or the newer traders with me that are still like beginning to uh, make some progress, that progress can be very quickly um, just steamrolled <laughs> by events like that. You know, it, it's kind of like a, like a tree, right? If you take a sapling that's, you know, just beginning to kind of sprout and then, you, you know, you kind of run it over, like sometimes it's just your foot is enough to kill it. But, you know, there's no way that I'm kicking over a, a full-grown tr full tree. So the, the longer that you are developing the strength and integrity within your mental game, the harder it is for you to fail in situations like what we just experienced and or, you know, to be able to capitalize on it. And conversely, the other way, right, if the progress is just beginning to kind of take hold, those events can be really difficult to capitalize because it's it is so emotionally triggering and those emotions can really overwhelm your ability to be as disciplined and robust as you need to be so the experienced traders are the ones that uh the phone calls and conversations are certainly a lot more uh, more pleasant <laughs> what would you say it takes to get to that level where you can capture these moves in the market is it like a, only a skill step it's more like soft skills like the mindset or what exactly do you need to be able to capture these moves and make them also the market basically uh, yeah, it's, it's definitely both. I mean, you know, the trading is not 100% psychology. Right? I mean, anybody that says that is delusional. Um, there's a there's a deep wisdom and experience and knowledge of the, you know, the strategic elements and to have a strategy that you know is profitable. And then, you know, there are some traders out there who they make their entire year on the six or seven times that you'll have big moves like what just happened. So, you know, to make sure that they don't get chopped up in the other 200 trading days is a big part of where the psychology comes in. So sometimes the psychology is as much there as it is in actually kind of capturing those events. Uh, yeah, it's, but, but either way, right, like you, you have to have, you know, the raw technical ability and have an edge that's actually profitable. Otherwise, you're just gambling, in my opinion. If someone tells you they want to get to a level with like the, the winning traders, the making money in the market, where would you start them to kind of go on that journey? Would they start with like the method, the strategy first, or would they start with something else first? I, I think you should start with method, yeah. If you are going to work on your psychology, um, examine how you've performed in other environments, like, you know, if you were in sports or in school, uh, you know, in other jobs, right? If you've experienced like major performance anxiety or, you know, you get really angry when things are unfair or you hate losing, you know, those problems are probably going to come out in trading. So <laughs> you can kind of start to get ahead of them by beginning to work on those problems that maybe weren't punished 
because all right, well, you played baseball and you know, so you hate losing. Who cares? The game's over. Like, what's there's no harm, you know. But here, right, once you lose a trade and you're gonna want to fire up another baseball game in theory, right? Like, you can do that. It can cause a lot of trouble. So, yeah, I think number one, like, spend like eighty to ninety percent on the method and the strategy and the technique and just understanding the basic parameters of actually how to trade profitably and then spend 10, 20% of your time, you know, examining any, you know, kind of past problems that you've experienced and develop some corrections to them. So you can begin to kind of get ahead of those problems because they will come for sure. Trading, trading exposes every weakness that you have. And if you're not aware of those weaknesses, then that's actually the biggest weakness. How do you spot the, these problems in the past? Like, are you, do you have any kind of tests you do or do you, is it like talking with a psychologist who knows that stuff or can you actually do, do it to yourself and identify yourself what you, like issues in the past that could come up through your trading again now? So, I mean, first off, like the mental of trading, like gives you like a big broad overview of like all of the problems that traders typically experience. So you can very easily just kind of skim through the book and just kind of look at the headlines and see like, all right, hatred of losing or greed or FOMO and, you know, low, lack of confidence or overconfidence. And then, you know, just kind of take those buckets and say, all right, well, you know, in, in the past, you know, have any of these things happened before? And you just, you know, maybe think about it, you know, day one, come back to it a couple days later, think about it again, maybe ask friends, family, people that know you well, past coworkers, and, you know, just kind of brainstorm it a little bit. I, I don't think there's a, you know, a, a hard and fast rule to find it. Uh, when I work with a new client, I have them fill out a very detailed questionnaire, but it's all very trading related. Um, but when, when I want them to kind of find, or I'll ask them like, hey, does, you know, this pattern seems pretty bad in trading. Like, does it exist anywhere else? You know, very often when you ask that question, like something is going to come to mind pretty quickly. So again, like you have FOMO and that can exist. I mean, my wife has FOMO. <laughs> you know, she, she missed out on going to the Taylor Swift concerts here in the U.S. So we ended up having to go to, to Ireland and Amsterdam to go see her, right? So FOMO exists in lots of places in life. If it exists elsewhere in your life, like if you... You know, if a bunch of buddies were going to go play golf or, you know, you missed out on a concert or, you know, hanging out with, with doing whatever and you can feel that FOMO elsewhere in your life, you will have it in trading. You know, so I'd say just kind of look at that, that list of problems and, you know, it, just be honest with yourself about, you know, here's the other thing. And I think you're right about this part, which is like it's going to be hard to kind of see. Part of the reason it can be hard to see is because it doesn't really cost you anything elsewhere in your life. There's not like a direct immediate consequence for it. It's like, ah, this happened. It wasn't ideal, but didn't cost me anything. So a lot of times it's, it's just not that well known. So you might have to go like living life with, for a month or two with this list of, of mistakes that you, you know, kind of got from the book. And, you know, when they happen, then maybe you'll be more aware, like, oh my God, like that was, I was clearly fearing making a mistake here. That that that's why I didn't, um, you know, uh, raise my hand when you know my boss was asking who was willing to volunteer for this project. Like I I didn't want to look stupid, right? So I go well. That's again didn't cost you anything. You kept your job. Nobody cared. But that fear of mistakes is going to show up when you when you're trading. Yeah, good point. So the mental game of, of trading is your book that you wrote in Trade Psychology. It's a big book. It's the, uh, there's a lot of stuff in that that book that people can definitely learn from. So they shouldn't read that first. I'll put the link below for that. And the most as well people can read it first. I mean, there's a lot of definitely mistakes in that that people can learn from. And it's good to be aware of these things first, at least understand like what can happen. And then you can spot these more easily if you know them first. Because if you don't know them, it's hard to spot them in trading when you trade. Yeah, I mean, you can't you can't fight what you can't see. Otherwise, you're battling a ghost, which is sometimes how it feels. <laughs> Definitely. What do you talk about the performance and kind of having a winning trader's mindset? How does taking breaks play into that? Because I guess like, yeah, you could like be all summer taking trades and like be in the market and like try to force things a little bit. Maybe if you make money that way, but how do you balance this out with like taking breaks and maybe you take a vacation to, instead of summer to kind of go away from the market? How do you kind of play out that balance between profits that you could make and taking time off? I'm pretty firm on this, that there's a line where, you know, you will actually get paid for taking time off, you know, now where that line is, is different for every trader. But when you recognize that you're no longer accessing intuition, that, you know, you know, you're making some bigger mistakes, you know, you're definitely kind of getting a little crusty, a little burned out, 
a little fatigued. Like those mistakes and your inability to kind of capture some moves, like it, it adds up, right? And if you're able to be well rested, then then those days off to recover that capacity and that performance means that you get paid for what you'd make up for. Not to mention that you get to actually enjoy your life, which, you know, is additive too, right? There's EV, you know, and the overall, you know, but, but to kind of find that line is, is individual, right? And what you need to kind of start to do is, is really look closely at, you know, what are the signals that tell you that you're, you're actually starting to get a little burned out, you know? And if there's a cadence throughout the year where it tends to kind of happen, like, you know, I'm good for a month, right? I can work my butt off for a month, you know, obviously taking the days off that are part of the weekend. Um, but after that month, I can start to get a little crusty. So maybe what you do is, you know, every fourth week, you take a couple extra days off, right? Maybe, uh, you know, take a Friday off or maybe two Fridays in a row. And then you go back to working hard for a month. Just something because it doesn't often require like a ton of time off to, to recover, especially if you stay ahead of it. The, the more burned out you get, the longer it takes you to recover. So the faster you can recognize, you know, so some of the signals might be there's just a little bit less, you know, interest and diligence around doing your pre-market prep, right? You're fine trading, right? There's nothing changing there. You're not even making any mistakes yet, but doing the pre-market stuff, doing the post-market stuff, ah, I can kind of start to half-ass it a little bit. So that, that might be the first indicator because when you're razor sharp, you're energized, like, you are diligent about doing everything you can to be well prepared and to make sure you're capturing all the information from the session. Um, so that might be the first signal. Or maybe it's the opposite, right? Maybe you tend to be more on the fear spectrum, right? Where placing trades is harder for you. So you be you end up being more diligent in your pre-market and post-market, you know, work, but then you start to hesitate a little bit more during the trading day, you know, and like, ah. You know, maybe even sizing down. Like there, again, there there are these markers. You just have to start to identify them. Then once you see it, you respond by taking that day off. You stay ahead of it. Um, I, I would say, generally speaking, it's optimal if you can take a week off once a quarter. <laughs> and I'm laughing because I know that no trader that's listening to this is going to do it. But it's one of those things where you really can't calculate the cost of that lack of a break, you know, kind of throughout the year. It's when you have like a legitimate opportunity to decompress and recover and just live life and experience things. And sometimes you learn things. Sometimes you, you're able to come back with a fresh set of eyes and see elements of your strategy that were like a glaring hole, but you couldn't see because you were too in it, right? Sometimes we can't kind of see the forest for the trees because we're so into the markets and so into our system but like you take those steps back not even just from a rest standpoint but from a, a development standpoint it can be you know quite impactful so you know if all right if you're not going to take a week off every quarter like try taking you know like a, a an extended long weekend like maybe three days off just experiment a little bit and see see what you find i love this i don't know if i can do it but i'm definitely gonna give it a try for sure it's a good one uh would you pick a time based on like when you think the markets would be less active, like so you could take a break or would you look at how you feel and how you perform and then take a break based off that? I would say both. I mean, look, I mean, if you can take time off when the, when the market's slower, like heck yeah, like then you're, then you're, you're getting paid, then you're, you're making money even more so, right? Cause there's not much opportunity and there's not much happening. So yeah, if you can do that, especially for your trading style, I mean, some traders, you know, they, they do like kind of end up making a lot of money around some of these market making market move, Sorry, uh, these big news events, right? Or, uh, you know, prints around like earnings season, right? Some, some series make a, bu a bunch of money around earnings season. So, all right, well, you got four times a year where you are definitely working, you know? And then you got some opportunities between hand where, where it's easier to take time off. Now, yeah, like if you were somebody that experiences FOMO, it's going to be tough for you to take that time off because your mind is going to be con continually grinding. So, look, we're, I'm not trying to say like, you have to go away for a week and not think about the markets at all. I do think that's optimal from a learning and performance standpoint, but like there's a money market, money making, you know, enterprise. So yeah, if you have to, you know, maybe like, you know, from the beach, look at the markets for the first, you know, two hours of the day. And if nothing's happening, then just go have fun like that. That's fine. I have, 
I have a client who, you know, he's 20 year veteran, you know, trading oil and natural gas. Like he knows at this point, you know, for his style, if nothing's happening in the first couple hours, he's off playing golf. And that's just like his normal work day. So again, you can kind of have some variety of how you do this. Um, but like to really trust it, right? I think sometimes traders end up kind of sticking around because, oh man, I, I have to capture every move and you know, it, it, like I'm a trader, I have to trade. It's like, no, no, you're a performer, right? You're, you're an athlete. You have to be sharp in order to capture your moves and be able to maximize them and then to be able to continue to iterate and learn. Because yeah, the market is evolving. The, there's, the, the competition, while it may not be felt instantaneously, right, is getting harder. That's why a bunch of traders love going to crypto for a while, right? All the algos and, you know, trading ES, like you go trade crypto, <laughs> at least for a while, it, it was easy, easy pickings because the volatility was so big. So my point is like there's, there's evolution that occurs here. And, and if you're going to stay sharp, it's not just about your performance today. It's also about your ability to continue to scale up and progress and again, potentially like stay ahead of the curve within the market's progression. There's a lot of opportunity to make money if you are a weapon capable of extracting it. Let's say you feel a little bit burned out for like you, you kind of tired a little bit of trading. How do you know when it's time to get back to it? Is it like, you, will you know from how you feel or will you just like have to set a date and go back to it? You, you, I would say in general, I would set a date and get back to it um, because there are times where uh, you know, you'll be off for, let's say, you know, that full week and you're like, oh man, this is so nice. I could, I could really use another week. And theoretically, you actually might not, right? Because sometimes the, 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 like the cobwebs, a little bit of the rust and the enjoyment can convince you to say that you're not ready, you know, but the reality is that when you come back, you know, you might not be immediately as sharp as you were before. Right? You might not immediately kind of yield the benefits of that, that the rest that we're after, but it's going to come back fast. You know, I, but if you're severely burned out, then you probably do need you know, a little bit more time. I, I think generally speaking, that's, that tends to be a little bit more rare, right? Unless you're like the true like workaholic where you know, you know, you're tra trading overnight sessions you know, regularly and you know, you're trading crypto and you're trading, you know, uh, you know, Asian markets and getting up for the, the London Open. And then, I mean, you can spread yourself thin here very quickly. But, uh, you know, if you're fairly regimented, I'm not saying that trading is like a normal job. It's definitely more intense than one. But, you know, the burnout should never get that severe, really. You mentioned some of these uh, veterans you work with who've been trading for like 20 years or more. What do you see they do differently from the you know the, the new guys or the the guys who've been trading me for only like five or six years? Or what's the difference? Are they, they have like different habits or completely different ways of doing things? Or just like a few tweaks that are different that make the difference there? So maybe the, we'll kind of qualify it slightly differently. I'd say the the elite traders that I work with that are you know that experienced, even from the traders that are twenty years in that are coming to me because they've got some problems. The, the the differences kind of tend to be that the elite traders have this like innate ruthlessness around correcting every single problem that they encounter for themselves, right? Like if they lose on a trade, they're not going to overreact and say that they made a mistake. But if they start to see some trends where they're not capturing as much of a move as they could, um, yeah, they're just missing opportunities that other traders are getting. Yeah, I mean, they're, they're going to like be very diligent and open-minded and aggressive at fixing that weakness. Whereas a lot of the traders that have been around for 20 years, they know they make money, they're consistent. Sometimes they lose a little bit of that, uh, almost like a startup mentality, right? That, and that's, that aggressiveness can easily happen to companies and it can happen to people. Now, the, like the, the traders that are five, six years in, same kind of qualities I see too, right? Some of them, you know, immediately, you know, kind of do well, they, they're full time, they're making money, maybe even seven figures and complacency can, can easily creep in. Uh, but on the flip side, the ones that stay sharp and are like, they, they want to keep scaling up, they've got bigger goals uh, and, and they're hungry to do that. Again, I think that the quality is this like ruthless aggressiveness towards fixing anything that stands in their way. 
not just kind of being comfortable with what's right in front of them. And, and I think you see that, that that's true of, of great athletes and great performers in general. There, there's also like a, like an open mindedness. It's, it's kind of funny, right? Sometimes you, you, you'll see like the, the traders that are, are doing well, but not great are sometimes more defensive, more, uh, close minded. And I, I don't think that's random. I think that the, the open mindedness to the elite doesn't feel like a weakness. They also are strong enough in understanding what they do that they're not immediately just going to like latch on to something new that they find, right? Just because they're open-minded doesn't mean that they're going to do and, and immediately integrate everything that they're learning. It just means that they keep a pulse on a lot more happening within the market, trends within uh, the way people are talking. Um, the closed-minded traders, you know, kind of put themselves in a box and yeah, I just think they learn slower and they, they adapt slower. They're the ones that can, you know, kind of be behind trends in either direction. I see traders who've been trading for like a long time. They make good money. They're really good at what they do, but like they're really not organized at all. Like they, they have no tracking of trades. They're kind of like all over the place. And the end guys are like, like really new to it. Super organized. Like keep track of everything else out there. Like they're super diligent, but then they don't make any money. Is that a factor for success or can you be like disorganized and still make money trading? Well, I mean, you just you just prove that you can, right? So I think if you were to, to put like statistics, though, on how many traders that were well organized are, are going to be successful versus traders that are disorganized, I would say that on average, the traders that are organized will be more successful. We're just kind of seeing, you know, the disorganized ones, you know, like kind of naturally selected out from or just sorry, naturally selected in from all the ones that, that didn't make it or at least that far. Um but sometimes the newer traders who are hyper organized, they think that that's like the main key to their success. And they sometimes can put more energy in, you know, having something that looks perfect, but actually functions within the trading day is like, well, your strategy is still not quite there yet. So I, I don't care how organized you are. You're not making money yet because your strategy is not, you know, actually profitable. So in that case, like put less time into perfecting the process and more time in you know, developing that strategy. So yeah, I think ultimately we want to have both. I think that's the key to being able to de-risk the long-term uh, chances that you won't be successful. What about the guys who have like ADHD and still want to succeed in trading? What can they do to make that happen? Oh, it's tough, right? Because, you know, ADHD seeks novelty. It loves adrenaline and excitement and dopamine and cortisol and you know the the markets are basically just like the best amusement park ever created <laughs> so it, it, you you have to start setting up some really kind of tight parameters um, and it might be advantageous to you to have a buddy in the trenches with you to kind of do it on your own is, is tough right to have some accountability to a person who can you know, kind of virtually slap you upside the head and tell, tell you to get the heck out of here or to say like, hey, dude, you're violating your rules. Like you said you weren't trading after after noon. You said you weren't trading these types of trades. Like, you know, you're 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 out. Right. And, you know, maybe find somebody else who has ADHD and you guys can be, you know, ADHD trading buddies. I, I think that's a that, that kind of accountability in the trenches is, is really essential because um, it's just too easy to like try to establish these habits, right? And then they're just going to fall by the wayside when, you know, like a dog who, you know, gets food put in front of them. <laughs> and in this case, the food is like, you know, a big wick. <laughs> like You're just going to, you know, have a hard time keeping yourself out of it and a hard time like actually closing down all the charts and your screens and walking away. It's just, you know, it's noon. There's still money to be made. I'm not leaving this amusement park. You know, you're going to have to drag me out of here. And that's, again, I think what having a trading partner can, can help you to do. I mean, it's not say it's easy to find, but I'd say it's, it's the challenge to do that. So you're saying that being called out can be a good thing. If I'm going to call you out on like when you do something wrong, can be a good thing for these people. Cause I know people will be called out on some things and they would, they would just hate it. They would want to be like alone and like doing it themselves. I'd be different for like different people, of course, but. Yeah. Yeah. I think if you're you know, have a, a, a like a decent self-confidence, 
that then you're willing to like admit when you're wrong and admit when you've crossed the line and you know you're happy when somebody actually calls you out for it you know and that can be a little bit of the kick in the ass that you need to make the right decision um, because you know as somebody with ADHD even if you're medicated right it can be tough to not respond to those impulses right that are just like flashing at you at all times um, so to have somebody to, to do that for you is, is is definitely great but you know yeah if you're if you've got a lack of confidence and yeah I mean it's it it, it yeah, and for sure, it could be a personality thing just in terms of being more introverted. Uh, so I'm not saying that uh, it's, a, it's the only way to get it done, but I am saying that you might just need to find some source of accountability uh, that at least can help you to help yourself here. So if you want to have some, some help about their trading, they can definitely find you a book, uh, The Mental Game of Trading. But I know you have some other stuff to have them more in-depth in and kind of go more in-depth on that stuff. Do you want to share more about how you can help them and what they can do to work with you? Yeah, so obviously I do one-on-one coaching as well, uh, but I also have a program called the Mental Game of Trading Live, which is kind of like one-on-one coaching in a group environment. So we do these strategy sessions where I'll answer questions, review worksheets, go over like you know kind of key topics like hating to lose or developing winning routines, and you know dealing with desperation or FOMO, and those topics are discussed as well as you know my direct advice to you know the the. Uh, the members who have submitted worksheets or kind of show up to the live sessions and ask questions. Um, there's also uh, a database of prior answers and, and, you know, reviews of worksheets and, uh, you know, lots of advice on, you know, greed and fear and FOMO and anger and tilt and lack of confidence and overconfidence and peak performance and intuition and decision-making. So all of the like major mental game topics have, you know, a good database of information that you can kind of go on at any time to get answers and help on. Uh, and it's actually at a pretty reasonable price. It's like one tenth uh, on a monthly basis, the price of my hourly uh, rate. So it's good value. Uh, Mental Game of Trading Live basically kind of brings the book to life. Sounds good. It's something I could have up a link below. Can check it out in the comment section and the description as well, so they can have a look at what you offer there. I know some some good work there, and I get a lot of feedback of students take your program, and they they say we have them a lot, and they love it. So it's good good to to have that for sure out there. Uh, thank you, John. I appreciate your time here as always. It's been good to discuss with you a few topics here. And hopefully you can do this in the future in Topic of Trading.